Another one? Well, all right. You're gonna make me do it, aren't you? All right, Adam, you can do this. All right, I'm Adam Andrews, and today on Top 10 Nerd, I'm bringing you part four, count of four, of the top 10 weirdest Marvel what if superheroes. Let's go! Number 10, Johnny becomes a living robot. We have talked about 1977's What If number six. It's the one where the Fantastic Four have different powers. You know, where Reed becomes a brain and Ben Grimm gains dragon wings, that one. Sue Storm gets the most boring power, just taking on Reed Richards' stretching ability, but Johnny got a power that doesn't really make sense to me. Growing extra limbs or losing your body, minus your brain, and being human rubber doesn't really make sense either, but how the cosmic rays converted Johnny into a mechanical living robot with metal parts that calls himself Mandroid, I'll never know. Johnny is now forever a living robot and can control other forms of technology. He's also eternally a metal version of himself which is honestly pretty good for a guy who loves his looks, because they'll never change. He's still a hothead though, so there's that. Number nine, WW2 Space Nick Fury. 1979's What If number 14 gives us a very different approach to history. Instead of World War II being fought in Europe, it is instead fought in space. In this alternate timeline, we discover interstellar travel much earlier in our history. And as such, the World War II we fight is more like space sector war between Sector Alpha and Sector Beta in space. Don't ask me to define where those sectors are, I cannot. As this is still set at the same general time as regular WW2, some of these same characters are going to be involved including the original Nick Fury and his Howling Commandos. New high-tech weaponry, fishbowl helmets, and aliens. It's a good bit of fun. We learn in the story that Admiral Von Strucker is actually working with the alien Axis powers to create a master race. So it seems we can master interstellar travel, but we still can't just accept each other's differences yet. Who put some reality in my comic book? Number eight, Thor, Herald of Galactus. Yes, the terrifying thought of someone as powerful as Thor becoming the Herald of Galactus is a strange thought, if only because it's so troubling. In this what if, Thor beats the ever-living heck out of the female Silver Surfer, who is the Herald of Galactus as he attacks Asgard, after she mortally wounds Sif. Seeing just how powerful Thor and his hammer are, Galactus stops the fight and offers Thor a place as his herald. Now, Thor initially says no, as we'd expect, and goes to keep fighting Galactus, but when the big purple dude points out that Asgard is in pretty bad shape, Thor takes one look, drops his hammer, and accepts. Just like that. Now, Thor makes a pretty awesome looking herald. Even in the odd style of the comic, choosing the most fearsome and brutal worlds to feed to the world eater, and sparing the weaker innocent worlds, again, as we'd expect. When Thor hears of Asgard being ruled over by Loki though, who de-lifed Odin and left Asgard in ruins, he takes some time from heralding to deal with his brother. Rediscovering his hammer and wielding it alongside the power cosmic, Thor becomes extremely powerful. Freeing his imprisoned friends and giving up Asgard for Galactus to feast upon, he destroys Loki and his frost giants and remains as the Herald of Galactus, saving innocent worlds from his destruction. Awesome. Number seven, Civil War Captain America. Honestly, I'm kind of a fan of this what if story, but it does have some strange moments and twists on characters you might not expect. For example, the story starts out with our Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes time displaced to the Civil War era. Bucky is the commander of the regiment and he is not a good guy. Apart from being an unhealthy amount of racist, he has quite the lack of moral compass. Our Steve obviously starts out as his scrawny and less than impressive self, but with a heart that shines through as strong and good. After sustaining injuries from not following his commander's orders, he is recovering in a nearby Union camp tended to by a private Wilson taken in by the Shawnee at a young age. Sensing the goodness in his heart, Wilson bestows a kind of eagle animal spirit on Mr. Rogers that makes you on the outside whatever you are on the inside. And this happens just as Barnes stumbles upon their location. The power of the ritual blasts Barnes away, and when we see his face, he has become the White Skull. Which, I mean, you could, you could just call him Skull, because skulls are white, you know, but... Whatever. And Steve has become a mystical super soldier, wielding a shield and sporting a headdress. He goes on to save presidents and leaves a lasting legacy of Captain and General Americas that continues all the way to the modern day. 
It's pretty sweet. Number six, Spider-Man Punisher. On Earth 71928, or the what if Peter Parker became the Punisher story, Peter's life remained pretty much the same as Earth 616 Peter. That is, until Uncle Ben's life was drawn to a close and in response, Peter dispatched the robber who did the deed. In a very Punisher-like decision, Peter decided to deal with crime from this point on by any means necessary. Meaning, he started de-lifing criminals. Peter tried to avoid this at first, trying to go his normal route, but since criminals are criminals, and they always come back, and he knows how much easier of a solution it is to just take them out Punisher style, he went full force into that lifestyle. The easy solution, in my opinion, is not the heroic solution, but hey, that's how it goes. He carried the blam blam that took out Uncle Ben's life, as well as other weaponry and multiple different types of ammunition. His suit also took a skull logo instead of the traditional spider logo. Not because they want him to look like the Punisher, but due to the fact that the spider that gave him his powers was a noble false widow, which has a cephalothorax that looks like a skull. That's the reason. Not because of the Punisher. Stop. Stop, he's not the Punisher. Stop. Number five. What if Ghost Rider was a baby? I know we keep pulling from this one, but that damn what if The Watcher was a stand-up comedian, what if comic is, it's honestly the gift that just keeps on giving. There is a full page devoted to the question of what if the Ghost Rider had possessed someone else, someone other than Johnny Blaze. And of course, instead of finding some other able-bodied man or woman, a cigarette smoking, leather vest wearing Watcher shows us the spirit of vengeance inhabiting the body of an elderly woman in a wheelchair demanding warm milk, a rollerblade wearing woman vowing to bring an end to disco, and an infant in a stroller. A big headed goo goo gaga who will hunt for vengeance after it finds someone to change its diaper. And just to make it 10 times better, this wee bab is wielding a cat, swinging around its head as it zooms around its hellfire stroller. I can't make this up. I honestly can't. Number four, Barbarian Hulk. All right, this one requires a bit of unpacking. So, in issue 23 of What If, the Incredible Hulk has fallen in love with a woman named Jarella, a green-skinned queen from the subatomic world of Kai, who was brought back to our world when the Hulk was unshrunk. In regular continuity, she is laid to rest after sacrificing herself to save a boy from some rubble during a Hulk battle. But in this story, she lives, and the Hulk and Jarella are shrunk again so they can go and live happily ever after, on the subatomic level in the kingdom of Kai. Now, Kai, for some reason, is very medieval slash Roman slash ancient in general, and Hulk, who now possesses his full intelligence, becomes king alongside Jarilla. Soon, a dark plot by some dark gods and their dark minions rears its ugly head, and Hulk, alongside a group of other subatomic barbaric heroes, goes to thwart them, facing off against a second savage Hulk that seems to have just been dispatched in like two comic panels. And that's where it ends. I'm assuming Hulk just stays subatomic and never returns to Earth, living as a microscopic barbarian for the rest of his life. Please check out this story. Number three, Doom. Sorry. <laughs> what would a good guy version of one of the strongest, most quotable, and most villainous villains in the pages of Marvel look like? Well, in issue 22 of What If, we get to see just that. When the Victor Von Doom of this universe discovers Reed Richards looking over his experiment notes, uninvited, he instead invites Reed to come help him out, which I think a true scientist would do. With Reed's help, he's able to contact his mother in the afterlife and learns of his royal blood. He trains in the advanced technology and mystical arts of an order of monks in Tibet and in the darkest places of sorcery and is granted, instead of his classic armor, this really sweet golden armor, evocative of knights. I think he looks pretty cool, but you know, that's just me. He uses his knowledge to free his mother's soul from the realm of Mephisto, and uses his technology and sorcery to free his kingdom from an oppressive ruler. And all goes really well, until Mephisto comes back, demanding the soul of his lover Valeria in exchange for the freedom of his people. Then he battles Mephisto once every year to try and save his love. It was almost a happy ending. Number two, Spider Actor. A second Spider-Man what if on this list? <laughs> oh my. In this what if number 19, Peter Parker makes the simple decision of stopping the robber who would go on to take Uncle Ben's life. That simple act robs Peter of the lesson of the responsibility of having great power. And instead, he turns to a life in the public eye. Now, as an actor, Peter turns his focus towards making films and protecting his reputation almost at any cost. He becomes the publicist for both the Avengers and the Fantastic Four as well as Daredevil. 
all while still retaining his Spider-Man persona. He even gets a cool cape for a little bit. It, well, it wasn't really that cool. When JJ exposes him to the public though, we see a bit more of an edge to this Spider-Man. When he threatens him and eventually ends his career. Which comes back to bite him when Jonah forms the Sinister Six, including himself. It is only after Daredevil jumps in to save Peter and fight the villains that Peter does actually learn that old power and responsibility thing. But man, Peter's a bit of a snob this way, I don't like it. Number one, Fantastic Five. I, I mean, four, five, four. Uh... In the very first What If comic, the question that is posed is pretty simple. What if, instead of rejecting Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four instead let Spider-Man join? Marvel's most popular family adopting Marvel's favorite hero? A match made in heaven. The Fantastic Five go on to fight crime and supervillains. That is, until the battle with Namor the Submariner. In this alternate reality, at the end of this battle, Sue Storm feels kind of cast to the wayside, with more focus being put upon Peter and the other members of the team and she leaves with Namor and becomes his bride. It completely stops the marriage of Reed and Sue from ever happening, which is just a weird, unnatural world to see. We don't like it. But life goes on, and the new Fantastic Four featuring Spider-Man go on with their lives. But now we don't get a Franklin or a Valeria Richards, and I mean, they're pretty important now, so... I don't know, let me know in the comments what other fallout you think would happen with Sue Storm being replaced by Spider-Man on the Fantastic Four. It's seriously an interesting question. All right, nerds, that's the list. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe here at Top 10 Nerd. I've been your host, Adam Andrews. You can find my socials down below. And until next time, peace out, nerds. Bye!